there's a saying that if you want to get rich in real estate, sell something to a realtor. So there's a majority of companies are looking at how to sell services to realtors. And as realtors, we have to look at what is our most effective use of our time? Where do we have the highest rate of conversion? And we have the highest rate of conversion when we get a warm referral. So if that's our highest quality appointment, what are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure we get more of those types of appointments? Yeah. Because if you can have those 20 conversations a day, you will find a listing presentation a day yeah. and a high quality listing presentation every day. Now you can service your business in less than three to four hours a day at a very high level. All right, you guys, welcome back to the Light It Up podcast. If you're new to this channel and you want to know everything there is about making money in real estate, selling, sales skills, building your business or investing, then subscribe below. Tap the bell for notifications so you can be the first to know what makes our great guests so successful. Let's talk about adding leverage. So we've been getting a lot of calls of people asking us how we've hired virtual assistants to scale and leverage our business. So we've opened up our playbook to all of you. If you're looking to add leverage in your business, whether it's administrative support, ISA outbound callers, go to adleverage.com and they'll be there to help you staffing your team. All right, guys, today we have Bill Laidler out of Vancouver, Canada. Bill, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. John Kiro, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, we're excited, man. We've got, uh, you know, as we've built the podcast, we've got a lot of realtors who have, um, you know, been following the show and a lot of them are slowly sort of turning into the investor uh, side of the business. So uh, we know that you uh, wear a lot of hats in your business and, and uh, we're excited to, to dive into that a little bit more today. Sounds good. But first, let's do the right the lightning round. Lightning yeah. round. Let's do it. All right. All right, so Bill, tell us if you could pick up a skill instantly. This is a sort of a goofy question, but if you could pick up a skill instantly, what would it be? If I could pick up a skill instantly, what would it be? A real skill. This isn't one of the fake skills, like a magical power. This is like a real live skill. This, sure. You could, this could be whatever <laughs> skill you want it to be. I'd like to be able to communicate more effectively. Mm, good answer. Don't we? Don't you could use that in a lot of different aspects. Yep. I don't mean you personally, because I don't know you that well yet. But um, now we could all communicate, whether it's relationships or work or. Mm -hmm. It's true. What's your skill? No, I'm. I, I would do the same exact thing. You're just gonna. That's, I'm, that's I'm, the I'm, easy I'm way. I'm bandwagoning. Out. No, but that's it's. Sometimes we want to communicate effectively. Like you know, you either have to have more conviction or whatever it may be. That's good. But that's that is good. Bill, what's your favorite quote? Live a few years of your life like no one else will to live the rest of your life like no one else can. I like that. Yeah, that's good. All right, Bill, what book has made the biggest impact on your life? How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Hmm. It was one of the first books I read when I was transitioning into the real estate career and uh, really opened my eyes to, similar to the previous desire to have a better communication, uh, learning how to talk to people, learning how to sell, learning how to being, being a contributor in, in this marketplace. Awesome, man. Yeah, that, that was definitely a big influential book for me too. It was, I feel like I need to read it again. I definitely read it, but it's probably 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, the way I was introduced is I was looking up Warren Buffett and I was just like, oh, who's Warren Buffett? And then I heard his story and he was like, this taught me how to communicate. I'm like, I need this. <laughs> All right, cool. If you could spend a whole day with someone dead or alive, who would it be and why? I could spend a full day with somebody dead or alive. Mm -hmm. Steve Jobs. Okay. Why is that? Steve Jobs. His personal conviction to his business and the way he approached his business is a fascinating story. And, and Apple's obviously extremely successful brand. It would be interesting to, to highlight what he's done in his business. Yeah, that's true. I think that's been mentioned before too. We've, we've heard so many different answers on that question. Yeah. We've heard like my grandmother. We've heard, uh, you know, my... It's a range. But yeah, it's, we've heard athletes, we've heard, you know, uh, business professionals, whatever. My second option was going to be uh, Jesus or something we've, religious. We've heard Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We should make a highlight clip of all the Jesus people, who, people who said Jesus. There's a lot. Why? You want to make fun of them? That's no. not right. <laughs> I would have picked Jesus I'm too. I'm just saying. There's a lot. <laughs> Fair. S speaks volumes. 
<laughs> What's the question? All right, Bill. Who had the most influence on you growing up? The most influence on me growing up uh, would be my parents, my family, mom, dad, brother, and sister. Yeah. Invested the most amount of time with them, and uh, they were all contributed to my life in, in different ways that had a big impact on me. Nice. Were they in the real estate business too, or? Uh, my father was a Vancouver police officer. And uh, my mom did a variety of different uh, jobs, including was a coach and a trainer um, for judo. Nice. She'd but, kick your uh, ass they if did. you didn't do what you're supposed to. <laughs> not just mine. She, she's one of the toughest. She's one of the toughest women out there. Well, wow. Wow. It's got to be scary for was, your mom to like have that type of person as your mom. I thought you were going to say it's got to be scary for my dad. Uh, yeah. oh, I'm sure it's scary that's for him, too. That's a good point, too. <laughs> but yeah, she's, she's tough. She's tough. Are cops in Canada allowed to carry guns? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Why so, would they not? I'm just, you never know. It could just be a baton. Yeah. How would he defend himself? Um, all right, cool. Speaking about family. So I I, I know I uh, saw a video of you up at a Mike Ferry uh, event, and Mike was speaking with you, and you went from living with your parents, working in real estate. Can you walk us through that phase, that journey of when you start, first started? And what year was that? Roughly. I, yeah, 2013 is when I entered the real estate industry. Originally, I was watching podcasts on the internet startups that were happening in California. And my initial goal was to build a startup company, an internet startup company. Mm -hmm. And uh, when my father retired from the Vancouver police that same year, he got his real estate license. And I started to see how my father was entering the real estate industry and what appeared to me as archaic processes. So I researched how to acquire clients online and found a company named Tiger Leads. Hmm. You guys heard of Tiger Leads before? Nope. Uh, similar to Boomtown yeah. or the other internet pay-per-click, um, Google Ads, they were sourcing buyer leads for real estate agents. Hmm. So I... Looked at the pricing and for only $2,000 a month, they would send me 200 leads. And I figured if we had 200 leads, we could close at least 10 of them every month. And went out, purchased it, recruited agents across Greater Vancouver and started investing into the internet lead company. As you may foreshadow, these leads were of varying quality and did not close at the same 10 deals a month that I expected them to. Mm -hmm. And was nine months into that investment and uh, had only had a referral check for one of those deals. Wow. Wow, but now at that point you had all those agents signed up, right? I had those agents signed up on referral fees. Gotcha. So we had to pivot away from that and uh, went and got my real estate license myself and then started uh, looking at different avenues to grow my business. And that's where I found first Haas Pratt, where we worked on expires and for sale by owners in my first year and then graduated up into the Mike Ferry system for my second to seventh year. Nice. Wow. We had Haas on the show. Haas is awesome. Yeah. Great guy. What was your, your production like on, in your first year and what was it like second year and so on? My first nine months, I did the one deal. Mm -hmm. My first full year, I did 49 transactions. Wow. Well, what was the difference? Moving away from internet leads to a listing-based business. That first full year was with Haas Pratt. Mm -hmm. Haas, I agree, master at his craft, helped me significantly understand how to earn for sale by owner and expired listings. That was 49 transactions, 38 of them were FISBOs and expireds. Wow. And the remaining were just the buy side of those transactions. That's incredible. That is incredible. That's awesome. So were you coaching with Haas directly or were you just like a student of his through YouTube or his books or whatever? It was Haas and I. Haas and I directly. Wow. Yeah. And were you, like, so he had a coaching program and you were coaching with him directly or, or and you were just one of his coaching students? Correct. Gotcha. I, I purchased the listing boss, yeah. which was one of his self-guided training <laughs> products and then upgraded into his live coaching. Yeah. That's awesome. man. I, I know, obviously know he has those platforms in that book and that's, that's of course how we connected with him. I just didn't know how long that book's been around, but yeah. I haven't thought about Haas in a long time, but he's, I just, his energy is contagious and he's just, uh, obviously I, I've never coached with him directly, but I feel like he would be a great coach. Yeah. No, he's a good dude. Highly, highly recommend anyone looking for a coach. Uh, to explore Haas Pratt. I know that he has an EXP line that he's working on as well that has some different product offerings that Haas is a great person to be connected with. Yeah. So when you went into MFO, what was your production in like the second year? Second year, I grew up to 60, 65 transactions yep. approximately. Nice. 
Okay. Was it same source, same majority of FISBO and expireds? We started uh, layering in uh, just listed, just solds. Uh, but still, yes, they were all cold leads. My first two years, I didn't touch my database. I uh, left my database alone and was working only cold, cold lead sources. Oh, that's awesome, man. So now you're doing something a little bit different. So when did you actually get out of production? Because many people, they want to get out of production, but it's almost like they're trapped in. You, you kind of figured out a formula to get out of there. Yeah, I was licensed from 2013 to 2020. I gave in my license in 2020. Happily or like angrily? <laughs> well, scared. Yeah. Scared for sure. As my lifeboat, my lifeline paid for my lifestyle, uh, but very grateful now that I, that I made that decision and wouldn't go back and change it. Yeah, you burnt that boat. So that was good. So, so talk to us about how your business is set up now. I still maintain a connection with my database. I still have my top clients and, and mostly my professional network. And our professional network, I, I include my, my best builder clients, my best investor clients, the lender who I worked with the most, insurance broker, the professionals that touch the deal with me or I have a closest relationship. Mm -hmm. I still call them every month or every quarter. They're still in my CRM. We stay in contact very regularly because those referrals that they give me, I pass on to a junior agent who's still licensed and she pays me a 75% um, referral feedback. Nice. So I still earn in that three to $400,000 range per year from referral fees without having my license. That's pretty awesome. That's great. Why is it beneficial to not have your license? Because my phone doesn't ring. Got it. So, so you put their name on everything and you're having them just take care of everything. Yeah. I, I tried for many years to run a team where I wouldn't be involved in the transaction, but I just burning the boats. I found myself, well, I'll, I'll go on the listing presentation. That's an important one. I might as well go. Yeah. Right? There's a deal blowing up. Like I better jump on the phone. Mm. I better help fix it. Whereas I found with this referral, I'm not involved. Lex goes out there. She'll interview for the listing. If the client wants to hire her, great. And she'll take responsibility, but it's not me putting my personal reputation or my personal service on the line. So it's helped me detach from wanting to control the process and ensure the clients have my quality of service. Got it. Good. So what's your main focus now in your, in your business? We've started a coaching company in April of last year. So we currently have 50 agents across greater Vancouver and the Fraser Valley in British Columbia, Canada that are part of our coaching company. And we work with them on the step-by-step -step process that I followed to not only grow my production, by my third year, I did $2 million in commissions and maintained that for a number of years before I tailed off. Mm -hmm. So we help them grow their real estate resale side of their business. And then similar to me, make investments into properties that have development potential. So the real reason why I was able to retire my license is because I built up a significant real estate holdings, significant real estate holdings of properties that have development potential. And we're moving through the multifamily development phase for those properties. And the agents that work with us want to invest into those same types of opportunities to provide them the financial independence to retire from real estate or move into whatever parts of the real estate business they want to focus on as their second level of growth. That's pretty awesome, man. And I know when we were golfing in Arizona, you were talking about like a project that you were working on. How have you developed any of these uh, projects or you, you, or any of them that you've completed, turned over? Can you share the process, especially like the beginning, the first one that you've done? You, you want to you wanna hear about the tears? The shit show, yeah. yeah. Get, <laughs> and by the way, Kira, Get emotional like John Sy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it's, it's process. Pro, no, process. You know, how did, how did you, how do you say it, Bill? Because you didn't sound, Process. you didn't have any Canadian accent until you said. Process. 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 What was the process from the beginning <laughs> and the tears? <laughs> to finish off my, my real estate journey, my first three years up to that $2 million in commission was all resale. All regular families buying or selling real estate. Investors, small infill builders. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I knocked on the mayor of Port Moody's house sometime in those first few years. And uh, he was looking to sell his property. I interviewed for the job and was able to earn his business and developed a great relationship with him, Mike Clay. Mm -hmm. And being the mayor of Port Moody, he started to teach me about the city's vision, about the community plans and where they're going to focus their multifamily, high-density developments into the future. 
So with that re relationship, I started to door knock in those development areas and earn listings for clients that had properties with development potentials and would sell those properties to the biggest developers in the city. When you, so approximately, when you say development potential, you're knocking on small single family homes that are sort of teardowns that could be torn down into building bigger, larger single family homes. Yeah. So for example, three 8,000 square foot lots in Vancouver would meet the minimum size requirement to build a 30 story high rise. Wow. So we'd be going into those neighborhoods, their property would normally be worth one and a half million dollars on the open market. And the developer will come in and pay them three and a half million dollars for the opportunity to build the high rise. Mm, wow. So started to build my business and transition my business into selling the properties with development potential. When we're pricing those properties, we work through the pro forma. How much can the developer sell the properties for, the end units for? How much is it going to cost them to build? What are their soft costs, financing costs? What's the expected profit margin to give us the residual land value of what we can list the homes for? Mm -hmm. At that point, I was 28 years old, full of confidence, looking at those profit margins, thinking, I'm finding all the opportunities. Why don't I just do these myself? Mm. So I bought, I put $20 million worth of land under contract and uh, started working through the development process on my first project. When it came time to close, we, uh, we had a choice. We could either get a high interest 10% loan, 90% loan to value, or we had an established developer who wanted to buy in who would put traditional debt in at three to 4% and bring an equity piece in. One of the big mistakes I made was turning down that partnership and thinking we could do it ourselves my brother and I and one other partner at the higher interest loan wasn't able to fulfill the timelines, ultimately got that loan called on us. And uh, it was one of the tough experiences I ever had to go through. We did manage to get the subdivision, that was a subdivision process, it was 40 lots in a suburb of, of Port Moody. And uh, we were able to get it to substantial completion and sell it to a larger developer and get ourselves out of it with uh, only small losses. But it was my first experience in the multifamily development space Realizing that not like real estate where I figured it out myself, you have to have deep experience in the construction industry to hold these crews accountable and don't do not recommend anybody anymore try and figure out the real estate development space themselves. Yeah. Wow. So that was a $20 million contract? Yeah. Five properties, two and a half million dollars each. So you guys had to come up with 10%. Yeah. So we put, we put $2 million in yep. and we had $18 million loan. Yeah. And how old were you at the time? 28. 28, yeah. 28. Holy shit. And, uh, but the other option you said, we, you could have partnered with somebody who would have brought in the yeah. equity. He would have brought in significant amount of additional equity, would have brought our debt down to somewhere in that 10 to $12 million range and uh, reduced the interest cost from 10% down to a regular credit union in that 3 to 4%. Wow. But he wanted 25% of the profit for that And at the time, investment. you thought it was too steep? On paper, there's $10 million of profit. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we can do this ourselves, can't we? Yeah. Wow. No. So once you would have gotten the, so you would have done the development yourself, like from ground up all, like develop the whole thing instead of just like getting approvals and selling it off. Yeah, that project, our, our business plan, because it was a 40 lot subdivision was to um, tear down the hoses, put in the road infrastructure mm. and then sell off the lots individually, the 40 individual lots. Got it, got it. So what are some lessons that you learned out of there other than you know, not doing it without the experience um, and the depth of knowledge for construction that you're now implementing in new deals? So there's there's a number of learning learnings I had there. So the first, the major one is unless you know what the process is to install those roads and services, then you can't hold any crews accountable. Mm. So for us, there was one of the, the electrical lines weren't put in correctly underneath in the ground. We had already put the new sewer connections in. We had already put the new water connections in and we had backfilled uh. the road. And then the inspector came, oh, you forgot the electrical. Uh. I forgot the electrical. I'm like, I didn't even know electrical needed to be in there. Yeah. So then I, I go to my contractor and he says, well, it's not my fault. Talk to your project manager, go to the civil engineer. He says, well, it's not my fault. Go talk, talk to the city. Mm. The city says, go talk to BC Hydro. So everybody's pointing their finger at each other. And I, ultimately there's nothing we can do. Yeah, the bill comes on you. Yeah dig up around the services, install the concrete encased feeder duct underneath our services at a significant timeline delays and a significant additional cost. I 
because I hadn't done it, I didn't know to look for it. Yeah. I didn't even know how to read the documents to know that that had to be included in the subdivision. Yeah. So number one, just knowing what needs to happen is most important. Yeah. The second most important learning that I learned is a commercial loan is very different than a residential loan. Mm. So a residential loan in the US, you're guaranteed for 30 years, or in Canada, we have five-year terms. A commercial loan is up for renewal every 18 months. Mm. So every 18 months, we had to get the property reappraised. And in that 18-month period, we had a dip in the marketplace. So when we had it reappraised, original initial lending was based on a certain value, and it had dropped by 25%, which means the bank wanted us to inject all the additional equity to bring their leverage back up. Mm. So not only did we have timeline delays, additional costs, we also had a market drop and the bank being scared about the market and calling the loan for extra equity. Wow. That's insane, man. At 28, how were you able to focus on production being only like, you know, still in residential resale too? For that six month period, we had to pay out of pocket $110,000 a month of interest payments. Wow. It kept me on the phones. Yeah, kept me <laughs> that's true, me. man. That's true. <laughs> that's the best accountability it's, you need. <laughs> it was high, high level accountability. The, the more, the more important skill set that I had to develop was to still maintain the high quality of service and the integrity in my real estate sales career while I had financial pressure behind me. Mm-hmm. Um, looking back, they, we all have certain deals that we wish we acted differently on, but I'm, I'm very proud of myself that we were able to service a majority of those clients. And, and I'm sure if you ask those clients now, or if they ever watch this, that, that they wouldn't have known what was happening in the background and, and still gave us great reviews in terms of protecting them and their positions, even though I had challenges of my own happening behind the scenes. Yeah, no, yeah. that's huge, man. And when did you feel like you had a handle or a grip on the, the, the land development aspect of it? <laughs> it's like once it was sold. <laughs> no, 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 not that project, oh. like just another project. Like when did you feel like so, you could actually? So yeah, we currently have a six story building under construction right now. Nice. It's a um, hundred units. Wow. And I did partner with a construction company and uh, grateful for their experience in the trades for 20 years and they're handling the construction side. So I'm comfortable and confident in designing the building or the unit mix selection, uh, working with the cities to get it approved, but I leverage and outsource the construction side of the business to established construction teams that um, can give us that confidence. Yeah, that's awesome. And what's the game plan from the, like, so you're building the six story hundred units, is that gonna be like a hold or is that something that you're gonna resell condos? We Yeah, we pre-sold the condos. Nice, okay. Was that the team, like your team that's in, uh, that was associated with it or did you? No, it was a difficult decision. We were, we were, we were thinking about taking it on ourselves. Yeah. But again, learning from the construction side, we'd never done pre-sales. And uh, it was not like, we only were doing it because the opportunity was there rather than being the best choice for the job. Yeah. So ultimately um, made the right decision, hired an established pre-sale team and they brought in their team members to sell the project for us. Nice. That's awesome. Talk to us about that project a little bit, though. Tell me, um, you said 100 units? Yeah, it's 88 units. 88 units. How did you find the site? And how did you maybe figure out who was the best construction partner for you? As I was um, selling real estate, earning commissions, I was consistently buying properties. And I was buying properties that had development potential. So yeah. we knew that this property, you could build a six story on it, was able, saw it, came on the market by an agent from out of town had no idea what the potential was, underpriced it. Mm. Sent them a subject free offer the first day it was listed with a deposit check attached and was able to um, purchase the property. So that secured the opportunity. I rented it out for a number of, number of years and started the, the application process with the city. Once we got far enough through the process that we had the confidence that the six story building was gonna be supported and how many units and how big the units would be, then I found, I started reaching out to construction partners it was about the same time that we were coming out of the last experience. And one of my goals for that year was to find a construction partner for this site. And as another local builder that I had worked with in the past, we never did a deal together, but we had talked about different opportunities as me as the agent. Mm-hmm. Um, he was coming out of another project, said he was looking for something. I shared with him what I had and uh, we were able to put a, put a joint venture partnership together. That's pretty cool. That's great, man. It's based off the relationship. So what kind of building was there before? Two single family homes. Two single family. And did you get them under contract at the same time or you had to sort of get one and work on the other one? 
Yeah. So the first one we got under contract at a good price. And then as the market appreciated, um, the city wanted us to expand the site for a larger development instead of a smaller development. So it was really under their encouragement to go get the neighboring property. Mm -hmm. So we uh, put an option on their property at the higher market value Got it. that we would only close once we had the approvals in place. Nice. That's smart. That's great. Yeah. This is, this is, uh, John's been geeking out about transitioning and he's finally doing it. It's been like his first, I would say for your first full year transitioning yeah. into like investments and purchasing and stuff like that. Yeah. And he's, uh, he lights up when he talks about it. And so do you, <laughs> you, you can well, see you it. can make a hell of a lot more money than, uh, selling yeah. these used houses as uh, <laughs> these used houses. <laughs> who, who would always say John, used? you, what's that? You shared, uh, you shared one of the challenges with buying these types of properties with your financing on the closing. Yeah. Can you share, can you share more about that? Well, I just had a struggle today. Um, it was a, with a hard money loan partner. I had lined up everything to close today and start uh, the contractors tomorrow on mm -hmm. Saturday. Dumpsters, contractors, uh, you know, they're doing demolition. We've got all these deliveries coming tomorrow. And uh, they changed the closing date like three or four times today or, or three or four times over the last week. So this morning they're like, oh, we may not be able to send out the wire today because we're having issues with the wire. And I was like, you're sending the wire today. <laughs> you just need to figure out where the money's going to come from. So they, uh, Thankfully, they were able to put some other closings off till next week. And the partner, our, our hard money partner, um, supposedly made it happen. So that's awesome. Man. I, when then we're done today, hopefully we've got some good news. But that's a single family home that we're just, you know, modernizing into a, a nicer single family home. I'm, I'm not anywhere into the uh, experience level that, uh, that you're at yet, but yeah, I'm working on it. Yeah. It, because what I've realized here is this. Right now, I've got five or six flips going on at a time, and they're all in 30-minute different directions. And it would be a hell of a lot easier to go to one site and have the, you know, that construction company working on one 10 units at a time or one building 10 units at a time than, than chasing all these different uh, people, yeah. which is obvious as that sounds, but it's just uh, we, got, we all have to do some bigger deals. Yeah. So just to take a sidestep, you were talking about Laidler Academy that being the coaching company that you're focusing on developing now and growing. Can you tell us a little bit more about the 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 process? Did I say it right? Process? Now, now you're saying it the Canadian way. Process. I like it. Can you tell us the process that helped you become a successful agent? So for those who are listening, interested about that aspect, what's that process look like for if you're inside of the Laidler, the Laidler Academy? Like, how does that look like? There's a few foundational pieces of the training. And we all come from the Mike Ferry system. And the Mike Ferry organization has a big impact on my career and some of the main foundations of, of, our, of our training and coaching. So um, starting out with a seven-year business plan, majority of the agents that come to us uh, and what we suggest agents do is, is work hard for a short period of time and let's leverage ourselves out of the business so that we're not going to be 30, 40-year realtors. That was a big fear of mine is looking at myself 30, 40 years from now and still being at the kitchen table, still hosting open houses. I, I just didn't see that as a pathway for myself. And the majority of the agents, we work on a business plan so that they can take themselves out of production in the next seven years. First part is what are your goals and where do you want your life to be in seven years? Hmm. Second part to that is into the foundations of training, which is the five-step listing process, your listing presentation, and the five prospecting sources that we teach. With the biggest focus on past clients, centers of influence, and professional network. Got it. And then from there, it's a lot of accountability being held upon the, 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 them from there. Yes. So we're group coaching. We we launch in cohorts of between six and um, between eight and sixteen. So the agents in our academy are all in a group call together, and we've partnered with Watson Powers to help facilitate that. On Mondays, Sydney Fullen will host the accountability portion of the training. And then Gordon Watson, Steve Powers, and myself host other training calls throughout the week on mindset, skills. And then my training calls are mostly on the listing presentation, pricing property, and understanding real estate development. Nice. Being that you're in the trenches and, and seeing how these agents are, are going about it, what would you say is one of the biggest struggles that some of these agents are going through? And what would, how would you coach them? Or how did you guys coach them through this? One of the biggest challenges is agents not wanting to come across as salesy with their database, not wanting to come across as pushy or desperate within their centers of influence or within their past clients. Mm -hmm. 
that was the difference when I when I did 65 transactions in my second year to 120 transactions in my third year is when I moved away from the cold sources and started to service my past clients and centers influence at a higher level. Mm. It was the fastest way to grow the company and it was the most cost effective way to grow the company. We already had trust with these people. We already had personal connections. And it just took me from getting over that call reluctance and repositioning my mind that this isn't me asking for business for my own personal benefit. This is me having a great quality of service that these centers of influence deserve to have themselves or their family or friends deserve to have because we're going to service them at a higher level than anybody else. And it's our obligation to reach out to them mm. to see who they know who needs our, who needs our help in real estate. Yeah. That's a major mindset, mindset shift. It's a hard one for a lot of people to get past. Still going through it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't want to make this a therapy session for you. Why is that? I, I, I you just, well, you're the, Carol's the kind of person who doesn't like to ask really anybody for help. So I think it's hard for you to reach out to anybody. Be like, and, hey, who do and, you know? And say, you know, who do you know that might, needs my services? Or who do you know that's looking to buy or sell real estate this year? And I, I'm not going to get into your mindset, but I mm. think that's just, it's, Carol's the kind of guy, if he has to move apartments and he, you know, wants a buddy to help him, he's just, or needs somebody to help him, he's not going to ask for help. He's probably just going to do it. Solo dolo. Yeah. No, so <laughs> it is for, it for is definitely to, a mindset thing yeah. it's, but we, we're in a very transient market so people tend to move and that final move is like out of state so it's like yeah a lot of them that move out of state it's a limiting belief thinking that because they're out of state they can't service or like know they don't anybody they don't yeah. still know people here yeah yeah so that's like where it's like oh okay it's a turn and burn but that's that's a very bad mindset to have i'm learning <laughs> i i went everyone goes through it all of us as salespeople go through that yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. How, if for one last piece of advice for somebody listening, how should they filter out? Because there's so much information, there's information overload nowadays. How would you filter out the good advice from the bad advice that people hear and see? For real estate agents, mm -hmm. there's a saying that if you want to get rich in real estate, sell something to a realtor. So there's a majority of companies are looking at how to sell services to realtors. And as realtors, we have to look at what is our most effective use of our time? Where do we have the highest rate of conversion? And we have the highest rate of conversion when we get a warm referral from somebody who has already worked with us or has a high level of trust. There's nothing better than somebody saying, John, my brother needs to sell. Can you go meet with them? Right. So if that's our highest quality appointment, what are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure we get more of those types of appointments? Mm. It's and true. it all comes back down to day to database. Yeah. Yeah. That is so solid. I like that's that. A, that's a great way to explain it. Yeah. I liked it a lot. Cool. And it's just reminding people every single day. It's it's not fun, but it's it's it what it's what pays the bills. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. And reclaims our time. Yeah. Because if you can have those 20 conversations a day, you will find a listing presentation a day yeah. and a high quality listing presentation every day. Now you can service your business in less than three to four hours a day at a very high level. Right. And you don't have to spend time earning that trust because if they came through somebody else, yeah. the trust is there. You're going to be converting at a much higher level than a door knock, even expired. Expires are second, right, second yeah. most recommended source, but still a hot referral is a hot referral. Yeah. yeah. No, that's true. That's very true. Bill, what's one thing you want to leave the audience with? We're looking for partners across North America. We have some exciting announcements to make next month, uh, uh, an advisory board of directors that we've established with some um, high quality people. And we're going to um, find our 200 partners here in Vancouver area. And we're going to be moving through the West Coast of Canada and Toronto this year. Next year, we're going to be expanding into the major markets in the U.S. And we're looking for realtors who want to be the resource in their communities for real estate, real estate development, real estate rights, and want to leverage themselves out of their business by being involved in real estate development. Can you share more about that or are you going to release that next month? <laughs> I, I can't, I, I can share more about the program. I can't share who the advisory board members are going to be yet, yeah. but in terms of our partners in the U S we're, we're not going to be open to everybody. Mm -hmm. We're going to find the right people to partner with, and we're going to go deep with those agents mm -hmm. because we know that 
our real estate development company is going to be stronger with the right community champions mm. and real estate agents are the right community champions because you have access to your net networks that are local who can help with approvals, who can help with the sales and will open up potential investment opportunities for realtors and their clients to be involved in multifamily development. That's sweet, man. That's exciting. That's good, man. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you. I'm excited that, uh, you know, you've been able to, I think the best way to tie this whole thing in, or at least the biggest aha moment for me was how you're trying to instill this belief in the realtors that you're working with that, yeah. that if you do this business the right way, you don't have to do it forever. Right. And I think of Steve Powers years ago, used to tell me like, treat this business like an ATM and just pull as much money out of it as you can and reinvest that into actual cash flowing investment properties that will pay you. Right. Yeah. So you can buy back your time and, you know, make money while you sleep, as they say. So Sweet, man. awesome. Well, thank you, Bill. So th this is this is wildly beneficial. I hope uh, everybody else thinks the same. Yep. And if anybody wants to reach out and collaborate with you or connect with you, what's the best way for them to, to do so? We're on Instagram, Laidler Academy, or myself personally, BN Laidler. Our website's uh, laidleracademy.com. Sweet, man. Awesome. LinkedIn, any of the other major ways to get in touch with people, I'm, we're all there. Great. Cool. We'll make sure we add the description, uh, the information in the description below. And then, uh, sweet, man. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate you guys.